Hi, I'm Tom Berkland, author of An Introduction to the Policy Process and Professor of Public Policy at North Carolina State University. I hope you enjoy the book and I hope you find these videos useful. Well, hello and welcome back. In this video, we're going to describe uh, interest groups, social movements, and uh, issue networks. Uh, as you learned in the first video in this chapter, uh, citizens are central to the uh, idea of public policy making in the public interest. But for citizens to be truly effective in influencing public policy, they need to organize. And this video is about the ways in which people organize to influence public policy. So let's get started. So let's start by talking about interest groups. And what are interest groups and why are they so important? And the reason they're so important is ask yourself this question, can individuals make change acting alone? And in our system, that answer is probably not. It's very difficult for people to, to, to influence change just acting by themselves. So what interest groups do is aggregate resources. They aggregate resources such as members. Aggregating members yields greater influence and greater power on the part of these groups. They also aggregate resources such as money and expertise. None of us individually can afford, for example, studies, lobbyists, public relations campaigns, things like that. But when we come together in groups, we often can. And of course, groups like industry groups um, have a very strong motivation to bring uh, together these resources to influence public policy. Now, interest groups also coalesce into bigger groups called advocacy coalitions. And we'll learn more about the advocacy coalition framework in public policy in chapter 11. But for now, just understand that interest groups often themselves don't act alone. That, for example, environmental groups like Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, Sierra Club will come together in advocacy coalitions to attempt to influence public policy. Groups or special interest groups are sometimes viewed as a bad thing. And why is that? And I think a lot of that relates to the idea of calling interest groups special interest groups. Uh, I've learned in teaching this course that when you call something a special interest group, it, it, it tends to imply that the group has a narrow set of interests that may not be the same as the public interest and that they're trying to get some sort of benefit from the government to which maybe they shouldn't be entitled. There seems to be a real normative sense to this idea of special interest group. And I think that that idea has suffused a lot of popular attitudes towards interest groups in general. And so Think of that as we're thinking about interest groups, because on the one hand, people may be uncomfortable with the proliferation of interest groups that are asking the government for very, various uh, policies and various benefits. But on the other hand, how else would we organize ourselves politically? Now, what are some examples of interest groups? Can you think of some interest groups? Uh, do you belong to interest groups? Do you belong to a group that presses for particular policy change? Think about your engagement with interest groups as we go through interest groups. Well, first, let's talk about some background. Interest groups have been around a long time. And, you know, Madison mentions them in Federalist 10 when he talks about factions. A lot of people uh, have interpreted that to mean political parties, which is a good interpretation, but also the idea of interest groups as a sort of form of faction is really important. And so we've known for a long time in our political history that interest groups are meaningful and important and are likely to exist in a, uh, in a representative democracy. There was a relatively small number of interest groups until the 1960s, but in the 1960s, there was some really rapid growth in interest groups. And I want you to take a second and ask yourself, what do you think it was about the 1960s that led to this rapid growth? If you want to pause this at this point and think about this before we move on, that'd be good. But why did interest groups grow so much in the 1960s? Well, here's some reasons why. One of the, the first reason that I want to discuss is the growth in government programs. When you create lots of government programs, like uh, programs to support education or fair housing or voting rights or things like that, you create clients for policy. That is, people that rely upon these policies. And with many programs, many clients, you create many interest groups that mobilize around the maintenance and expansion of those government programs. 
Another reason for rapid interest group uh, growth is that there's a lack of legal constraints against group formation in a democracy. There's nothing that prevents people from forming groups. And indeed, the Constitution uh, acknowledges that people have the right to peaceably assemble and petition the, the, the Congress for the redress of, or redress of their grievances. Uh, the, the, the First Amendment of the Constitution invites the creation of interest groups. So there's no constraint on creating groups. And in fact, there's significant motivations for doing so. And I said, there's no, no constraints. There's no legal constraints from doing so. There are resource constraints, uh, other constraints. If you're a very unpopular group, for example, you may not get a lot of attention, but there's nothing preventing people from attempting to form groups. One might argue that there's an increasing number of public demands that have been made of government in the last uh, several decades, particularly through the 1960s. And therefore, there were uh, increasing demands uh, on the part of the government for more resources to be provided by the federal government to ameliorate various social problems. But there are also demands for the, for the, the uh, maintenance of rights that were created under the Constitution or under law, such as uh, various civil rights the rights of women and minorities, those sorts of rights caused groups to mobilize. So the, the gay and lesbian movement, the women's movement, the African-American civil rights movement, all of these things uh, were a uh, manifestation of people's mobilization to, to secure their rights. So interest groups are, are fairly common, but oftentimes big change in the United States is the result of a social movement. And social movements in, in American history are, are generally not very common. They're somewhat rare, and they happen uh, probably once in a generation. And some examples are things like the Civil Rights Movement, which uh, spans more than one generation. And the Civil Rights Movement in the United States is, was a very long-lasting movement and still continues to this day. It's, it's not over. The Women's Rights Movement also uh, has a long history in this country. More recently, uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and, and queer people rights, uh, the GLBTQ uh, movement. Uh, is this a social movement? Uh, that's something you want to consider. Is the social movement similar to civil rights, women's rights? It seems to have all the features of a, of a social movement. Are there other social movements? I think the environment might be uh, a, uh, an example of a social movement, but are there other uh, social movements that you can think of that have had an influence on policy change in American history? Now, social movements include a broad range of groups. So social movements are another way that groups coalesce together. So if you take the March on Washington in 1963, at which uh, Martin Luther King gave the I Have a Dream speech, that was a, an event that was organized by a number of uh, civil rights, labor, and other groups. So social movements are another way that groups coalesce to influence public policymaking. Now, in political science, we talk about different kinds of interest groups, and, and there's two broad categories, um, institutional interest groups which is a group that you're a member of because you're a member of a, a particular category. So if you're a college student, for example, then you're part of the institutional interest group that defines college students, or I'm not quite 60 years old yet. So at some point when I become retirement age, I'll, I'll be part of a sort of an institutional group of retired people. If you belong to, if you have a particular kind of profession or job, like you're a doctor, uh, you might, uh, be considered institutionally a member of the, of, of the medical interest group. There are formal groups that relate to these. Like if you're a college student, you have a student government like um, the Associated Students of, of whatever university you're at. But oftentimes people don't really feel like they're a member of the group because they haven't really taken an affirmative step to join it. They just exist as a, a member of a group that exists because they're institutional standing. But then there's also membership groups, which are groups you choose to join. Uh, and I always ask my students, are you a member of an interest group? And if so, why did you join? What was your motivation? In particular, what benefits did you receive from joining that group? Now, many of you, for example, may belong to uh, the AAA, AAA, the American Automobile Association. And you may not think of that as an interest group, but it is an interest group. It lobbies Congress for more spending on highways and things like that. And But you've said, well, I joined because... Uh, of the towing, you know, in case your car breaks down. And I think it's a good idea for you to join for that reason. 
But a lot of times people will join these groups for the material benefits that they provide, not necessarily because of the policy positions they take. And you may join a particular kind of interest group, such as the, the World Wildlife Fund or the Sierra Club or something, because you get a magazine or a calendar or some bit of swag or something that, uh, that you're proud to display, but that, that motivates you to join on, on grounds other than simply the policy grounds of the group. So people join interest groups to gain some sort of a benefit, uh, maybe a material benefit like being able to get towed or maybe some sort of economic well-being. Maybe you join an interest group because you believe it'll, it'll improve the economic standing of your group or profession. But other times we join interest groups out of a desire to do good. We believe that we're doing the right thing. We're, we're serving the public interest by, say, joining an environmental group. We believe that it's uh, the right thing to do. Oftentimes, we'll join an interest group to belong to or identify with a group. And you can see that manifested on things like bumper stickers on cars and things like that. And that's a powerful motivator for people to join together in groups. And there's a desire to, to find a way to make one voice heard. Uh, as I mentioned before, the power of individuals is multiplied a great deal by joining interest groups. And so that's why we join groups. And then, of course, there's the the pecuniary interests, the magazines, the calendars, the various uh, sort of goodies you get by joining a group. And uh, that might motivate some people to join. And for years, uh, certain groups like the National Geographic Society, you might be a member of the National Geographic Society, but you, you did that only because you wanted a membership, uh, a subscription to the National Geographic magazine, for example. So that's an example of that kind of a group. Now, there are different kinds of membership groups, and these matter in terms of policymaking, in terms of the nature of the groups themselves. And the first of these groups are what we call economic or private interest groups that are groups that are primarily interested in benefits for their members. And these are things like the National Association of Manufacturers, the Industry Association for the Airlines, and Industry Association for Railroads, for Electronics, the Motion Picture uh, Association of America, you know, big industry groups like that. And they're interested in preserving the economic standing of their members. And the question I ask is, do you think they will at least argue that when they're members benefit, the public benefits. There was once a belief that was what was good for General Motors is good for America, one uh, executive once said. And I think it is true that, that, that economic groups will argue that the pursuit of their interest will yield benefits for the broader public at large, or conversely, that the pursuit of a particular policy intervention uh, might yield burdens to the group, which would then be burdens upon society. So, um, Economic groups, industry groups tend to be smaller in membership, tend to be uh, powerful interests like the automobile manufacturers or professional groups like doctors and, and lawyers and things like that. Now, public interest groups are groups that seek to create benefits for everyone and act in the public interest, but it's really hard to define a single public interest. Even in something like the environment, like clean air, clean water, green space, it's hard to, to make a case for the broad public interest. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It means it's just you really have to make the effort to, to make the case for this. Now, there are other types of groups like churches, people joining churches and things like that that are civic groups that don't fall neatly into either of these categories, but they exist and they're important parts of our civic life. Now, what do these groups do? Well, they often lobby elected officials such as members of Congress. And when we talk about lobbying, we mean providing information often to members of Congress. So for example, my university is a member of a group called the Consortium of Social Science Associations or COSA. And like a lot of organizations, we have a lobby day in Washington, DC. And last year we did it virtually because of COVID. But what we would do is call staffs. And this is what groups do. They talk to congressional staff. And we said, 
there's a lot of people that at my university and at other universities that know a lot about this COVID pandemic and can provide you information that is helpful to you in addressing this problem. What can we do to help you? So it's not, you know, necessarily arm twisting. It's not about campaign contributions necessarily. Uh, oftentimes it's just the offer of providing information, information that a group wants a member of Congress to have. If I was part of an industry group, I would be providing information about how many jobs my industry creates in that member's congressional district, for example. So lobbying is an important part of what a lot of interest groups do, and that is providing information to members of Congress. They can also go public, you know, run uh, advertisements in, in various uh, newspapers, magazines, television, the internet, things like that. All of these are intended to provide information that influences elected officials. Uh, some interest groups can be more overtly acting in support of candidates through things like money, campaign contributions, uh, mobilizing their members to vote for particular candidates. Under the tax code, uh, interest groups that are set up as charities have to be very careful. You can't be a charitable organization and influence elections, so they'll set up a separate organization that'll do that. And groups also mobilize members to take action. They mobilize members to write to members of Congress or call or to uh, even engage in rallies and other forms of protest. Uh, some groups will sue in court for the declaration of, of a law or policy. For example, the, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund was the uh, organization that was behind a lot of the lawsuits, including Brown versus Board of Education, which led to school desegregation. And a lot of groups will mobilize their members to engage in public protests and direct action, such as uh, marching in the street. And I don't want that to suggest that, that this is uh, unseemly, that public protest is a bad thing. Public protest is something that is uh, uh, enshrined in the First Amendment of the Constitution, where uh, public protest becomes problematic, of course, is where there's violence on the part of participants or on the part of uh, law enforcement that's re reacting to protesters. And there have been instances in our history in which peaceful protest has been met with violence, but groups will oftentimes uh, set a date and a time for a rally and uh, people will attend those. And, and those are an important form of political expression and an important way that groups can show their power by mobilizing a large number, a large number of people to take to the streets, which goes to this point about groups and power. Now we all know that some groups have more power than others do. That is say they have more influence in the political system, but what is power and why do some groups have more power than others? Well, groups differ in power because they have different resources, such as money, such as information. And with that, by the way, comes access then to the people that uh, are most influential in public policy. If you have the funds and the information, uh, you may be able to sustain a campaign to influence uh, the people that need to hear your message. The size of your membership might be a reason for your group to be powerful. Uh, but more to the point, the reasons for membership might be more important. The groups that are formed because members have direct economic incentives to join tend to be more influential than groups that just are, are acting in the broad public interest or groups that uh, provide material inducements to broad members of the public to join them, right? So the National Association of Manufacturers or the U.S. Chamber of Commerce might be relatively small in the number of members compared to a big environmental group or something, but those individual members have uh, powerful incentives to, to come together and provide information into the, into the policy system. And of course, groups whose goals are congruent with prevailing ideas and values are more likely to gain attention on the policy agenda and are more likely to be influential uh, in public policy making. Now, as you said before, groups come together in social movements, which are a broad-based effort by a large group of people, a large group of groups of people even, to make fundamental changes in public policy and attitudes. And they often coalesce around high-profile issues, which we described earlier, but things like civil rights, uh, women's rights, and the like. What constitutes a social, uh, an effective social movement to you? What do you think is an example of a social movement that succeeded in its goals 
And what was it about that social movement that made it successful? One idea you might think about is that social movements succeed when the time is ripe for their ideas to take root in American politics. But there's some other reasons why, why, um, why social movements might be successful that, that you'll want to think about. Now, another way of thinking about how we organize groups is in what we call sub-governments, issue networks, or policy domains. So policy domains and policy communities describe the interactions among actors in the policy process. So what requires these interactions? Well, they have to know about each other and they have to know each other's positions on issues. So policy domains, examples of policy domains are things like the healthcare policy domain or the environmental policy domain. And within a policy domain is a policy community of the actors involved in policy making in a particular domain. Some examples of groups of actors, for example, are groups of environmental groups or groups of industry groups that, that come together and uh, work together in coalitions to move public policy in a particular direction. So this relates to the idea of sub-governments and issue networks. Now, in, in your studies of American politics or public policy, you may have heard of the idea of iron triangles and log rolling. The idea of an iron triangle is that in, in a policy domain, you've got an, a regulated uh, interest like an industry. You've got a government agency that regulates that interest and you've got the subcommittee in Congress that addresses that issue. Uh, it, this may be a regulatory issue or it might be a benefits issue like agricultural subsidies or something like that. And the idea is that this is a closed system that's mutually reinforcing that the members of the system help each other out by, for example, support for reelection or support for the agency mission or subsidies to the interest in question. But we don't really think that most policy making is characterized by uh, iron triangles, we tend to think of them as, uh, as sub-governments. And a sub-government is the policy network that's most interested in policy making within a particular domain. And another way of thinking about it is what Hugh Hecklow called an issue network. Now, Hugh Hecklow wrote that the idea of iron triangles wasn't wrong as much as it was uh, dangerously incomplete, that there are more actors and relationships in sub-governments than in the old Iron Triangle uh, not notion. There are various government agencies, committees, and groups, and the like that are involved in the making of public policy. So that's an overview of groups in the uh, making of public policy. Uh, most of our theories of the policy process rely on the idea that there are interest groups, that interest groups come together to join coalitions, and that uh, policy making in uh, various policy domains can be characterized by different types and styles of issue networks. And I think this is going to be really important for you to keep in mind when we get into the more advanced theories of the policy process in chapter 11 of this book, and as you continue your studies in public policy. I hope you found this useful and I hope to see you next time. Thanks for watching this video. As always, I really enjoy hearing from students and teachers about the book and about public policy. Feel free to reach out to me at tom at tomberkland.com or visit my website, tomberkland.com. Thanks again for watching.